Hi, Kim. Hi, hi, John. How you doing? Hello. How are you? <laughs> I'm good. I'm good. How, how have you guys been in lockdown? It's a double-edged sword. I mean, <laughs> sometimes uh, it's the uh, worst nightmare, as everyone knows, and sometimes it's actually quite pleasant. Yeah, it's, you know, con considering it's just, you know, the, the worst thing is missing the team. You know, we, we um, my team works on a lot of uh, special projects. You know, we did the Unreal Engine 5 um, announce uh, thing that we did earlier in the year. And we're used to collaborating. So the fact that we can't hang out together and we don't go to the pub together, it sort of it stifles creativity a little bit. But we're coping. We're, we're making do. Mm. Yeah, once, once we're out of this lockdown, you guys have to have a big reunion party or something. Um, I think the whole planet is going to go crazy. Guys. Yes. Yeah. It, it's it's going to be like partying like uh, we should have done in 1999, but we didn't really because everybody was good. It's, uh, it's probably yeah. going to be a slow ramping, uh, yeah, a slow ramping come together. I, it is. It would be nice if it was on one day, you know, so we could all <laughs> run out into the streets. Uh, but yeah, it'd be probably breakouts of hugging here and there. <laughs> Absolutely. So I want to take you all the way back for a moment and ask, what was it that made you want to get into visual effects in the first place? And we'll start with you, John. Hmm. Well, I think that uh, in my case, that turned, uh, that was uh, the product of probably the place that I was and the time that I was there. I uh, went to school in New York City and uh, uh, specifically NYU, and uh, lived, lived in New York City. And like London, I think a lot of people would agree that just being in a place like that uh, is nearly a world-class university-like education unto itself. Uh, everything that's happening in, in, in places like this, the types of people, the arts, the innovation, all, all of these sorts of inspirations being around you, um, have as much of an impact on you as perhaps what's happening in the classroom. And in my case, I got uh, sort of connected with people who were interested in not just only storytelling, but, uh, but more experimental uh, media, experimental filmmaking. And, you know, some were not even in the school. And, uh, you know, mostly sort of found my way there into, into effects like things um, through, through, through others who are like experimenting and um, mostly uh, not necessarily in the beginning had, in, had much to do with uh, commercial filmmaking at that time. It, was, it had to do with you know, other, other sorts of expressions. So I'd say that's how I sort of started to dabble. And then I, over time, I, you know, sort of uh, realized I could fit inside that community and they, they accepted me, they let me do, you know, anything. Uh, you know, I could touch a light, I could load a camera. Uh, so I, I, I stayed in that, in that scene and, you know, discovered that, you know, there was more that I could do than just, you know, um, you know, move things around and grunt things, but y'all, every, everyone has to do this in the beginning. Everyone has to learn, be mentored in that particular way. But I, I, I love the whole uh, experience of that. So I'd say that's how it began. And I, then I essentially followed others who, you know, were getting opportunities on, you know, more interesting things like, like proper films. And uh, so I, uh, it was more or less led in, into the, uh, into the more pro side you know, from friends and colleagues, you know, who are starting to get breaks. And in my case, um, just specifically not to belabor it, you know, there was a kind of a contingent of, you know, Californians that had come over to the East Coast of the U.S. Uh, and they had um, essentially were bailing out of that state. They were like famous uh, uh, special effects pioneers and innovators, and they decided to nestle into uh, of all places, uh, the sort of remote areas of Massachusetts, and they built a super studio in the middle of nowhere because they could they could be left alone, they could be private. There was no, you know, distractions uh, that come from the industry where they decided to build this place. And 
uh, that that the first particular place like that uh, for me was this uh, uh, founded by a fellow named Douglas Trumbull, who uh, was the uh, supervisor for 2001 Space Odyssey, uh, Blade Runner, Close Encounters. He invented uh, new formats of film like show scan, which is like high frame rate, uh, which is, you know, taken for granted now. It's like, um, so very experimental formats uh, and immediately put me on this, this track towards um, sort of breaking, you know, breaking form instead of, you know, mastering one form. I see, I see. And for you, for you, Kim? Yeah, um, so, uh, you know, I, I studied computer science um, at university in the 80s, a long time ago, um, and uh, specialized in computer graphics. And, um, you know, I was fascinated by the idea that, you know, we could write code that could represent the real world in a way that you could interact with. And around about the same time, um, Tom Smith um, at ILM put out a book, um, I think it was Industrial Light and Magic, The Art of Special Effects. It was, uh, came out in about 86. And at the very back of that, you know, it, sh it shows, you know, Dennis Muren and Ralston and all the pioneers and my friend Paul Houston, you know, making the Star Wars movies and all the techniques they use with miniatures and pyrotechnics and all that sort of stuff. And at the very end, there was a little bit that talked about the Pixar computer and Ed Catmull and this um, little experimental movie that they'd made, Wally B. And uh, there was a, a little bit of coverage on, um, the, uh, was it Young Sherlock Holmes, the sort of the first you know, CG stuff that I had put into a, a movie. And I'm like, you know, what I like doing and what they make in films, these things are gonna cross over. And uh, it was pretty much at that point that I was like, you know what, I think uh, when I finish university, I'm gonna go in and uh, see if I can get a job in the film business. And um, I was lucky enough um, in, uh, I think it was 90 or 91, I got a job at um, the computer film company in London, which was the, one of the first visual effects houses in Europe to start to do digital visual effects where we would take film, scan it and uh, uh, process it in the computer. And I was a computer programmer. And in them days, you couldn't just buy software and click a button like you, are, like you can today when you, you know, download Unreal Engine, you can just play with it. You had to make everything yourself. So that was pretty much my introduction to the industry. And, um, you know, I, I basically um, moved from coding to supervising um, probably it's probably the um, mid 90s um, uh, as I realized that if you really wanted to push the envelope in filmmaking with computer graphics and visual effects then you had to be calling the shots you had to be one of these visual effects supervisors so thanks to a friend of mine Richard Urisich uh, I was able to get a, um, a sort of promotion to be digital effects supervisor on Event Horizon I don't know if you ever saw that that, that, that was a crazy horror movie by uh, Paul Anderson um, that we worked on. And that was the beginning of supervising and also specifying, you know, we'll do this software, we'll do these algorithms. And then uh, uh, eventually got to work with John on a movie called What Dreams May Come. I think it was 97 that we uh, we did that. So that's that's pretty much the journey of, you know, what got me into visual effects. And now you're here. Amazing. <laughs> I wanted to ask you uh, about What Dreams May Come. You mentioned that was the first time you worked with John. What were your first impressions of one another, guys? Well, the, the first time I met John was uh, I went to Massachusetts for an interview because I, I wanted to, we wanted to move to the States and um, they were setting Mass Illusion where John was working at the time was setting up an office in, uh, in California, in Northern California here in the Bay Area. And, uh, I, you know, the interview was at Massachusetts. So I met John um, and uh, Skylar, John's kid's going to be all embarrassed now. I met John <laughs> at the Mass Illusion office in, um, where were you, Lenox? Lenox, Massachusetts? That's where it was, yeah. isn't it? Yes. And uh, yeah. I, I, this, this guy comes up and uh, he's got this little tiny baby on his arm, on his shoulder carrying him. And that was Skylar. And actually, fun, funnily enough, Skylar works for Epic nowadays. He's in our, you know, our, our, our uh, marketing team. But uh, that was the first uh, the first meeting just to talk about that show and then talk a little bit about this crazy project that John was going to be working on. Uh, yeah, I would say also, um, since we're taking that memory lane trip, uh, you know, I had um, been working with at the time in the studio in Lennox with um, a couple of you know uh, common friends and colleagues of Kim's as well from the UK a couple of people there was a, essentially a you know a sort of a bit of a British revolution in the in the uh, in the US visual effects industry really um, at that time 
um, it really was um, kind of this crossover point between between the, you know, the highest end analog <laughs> that people were able to do in special effects and the, the beginning of, of digital, really. And um, Kim and some of his colleagues uh, were really the very, at the very, very beginning of, of the, the digital wave. Um, the, 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 the whole con some, some whole concepts that we take for granted today, uh, compositing. Um, using um, algorithms to essentially create uh, uh, change in photographic imagery, um, computational photography, the beginning of these things uh, were rooted around that time. So we were lucky as young, younger men to be at that crossover moment. And, you know, uh, where I was at the time, we were interested in uh, in that form of experimentation, we had things that, uh, you know, we felt like we were up against the edge of the boundaries of what we could possibly do. So, you know, around that time, uh, Kim, Kim arrived and, you know, there were these ambitions that seemed, you know, you, you, you always know that you're in the right territory when really the, the, the request, the, the creative request, you know, to create a, a world or what have you, um, is really uh, exceeding uh, the sort of um, the known abilities of the time, right? Yeah. Where you're like, you're being asked something and you're like, no one's done that. Like, you know, you just flat out know that you haven't been there before uh, or it's described, but the key is for it to be described in the right way. So there is this relationship between the creative and the, uh, and the technology uh, innovation uh, and if it can be expressed and described in the right way, and you are lucky enough to have assembled uh, the right type of uh, uh, people, minds who can sort of, you know, pull together building blocks that you are just emerging, then you might have a chance to sort of reach that, that new spot. So at the time Kim came, really we were, you know, in the midst of not just uh, what dreams may come, but we were also in the midst of the origin uh, research for, for the matrix. Both of those projects were happening exactly at the same time. And they both had a question uh, that exceeded the sort of understanding or knowledge of pretty much anybody in the industry. And so it was like, okay, um, here seems, you know, a person who, uh, in my view, uh, that uh, seems to uh, be, uh, about making uh, you know new paths. So anyway, we hit it off rather well, and also as just friends, and you know same you know we were the same age and had the same interests and such. And so that was that was the beginning. We came together in Massachusetts, uh, and you know there was a lot of crazy, insane. We can't. We don't have enough. We we need a ten hour series to talk about all of the trials and tribulations of trying to keep um, these companies, these studios, right standing straight up while we were making these movies. They, you could literally write books on how complicated it was behind the scenes uh, trying to um, keep these studios that we were working on with um, uh, uh, solvent <laughs> and moving forward while inventing, right? With, we have a lot of, lot of um, good stories there, but that was the beginning. You know, what, one person that should get a, get a mention is uh, Nick Brooks. You know, we have a mutual friend that was the guy really that brought us together. Nick had worked with me at CineSight, um, um, and then he moved to the US to work with John at Mass Illusions. I think you all worked on a Judge Dredd movie at some point. Nick was this very special artist that he was, was super artisanal in the way that he would approach creating. He was a compositor by trade, un unbelievable eye, super creative, but he loved technology in, in, in the same way as you know, some chefs like to understand the chemistry and the science behind how flavors come together to make a new type of experience. He was sort of the same, a little bit of an alchemist when it came to technology and the artistry of visual effects. So, I, you know, and Nick was, um, Nick realized that you uh, needed a decent technology foundation to be able to do some of these things, you know, that, that people hadn't ever seen before in cinema. So, you know, what dreams may come, they wanted to make this painted world and, you know, the, the, the most natural way to shoot it would be to shoot live action in a beautiful environment and then have a computer work out how do you turn that into looking like a painting? And, and Nick knew, understood that 
actually science and the ability to track every pixel, this technique called optical flow, would enable um, them to have the creative tools that they needed to be able to visualize this movie. So yeah, we have to, we have to, you know, to, to, to acknowledge Nick's awesome part of bringing everybody together. Amazing, amazing. I'll only add to that, John, once you're done writing those books, I'm expecting an autographed copy in my mailbox fairly soon afterwards. Just saying, I want to read that. I want to read that. <laughs> uh, you, you mentioned The Matrix there, uh, which is a film which I absolutely love. And the big pioneering visual effects in that film are amazing, especially bullet time. How did that come about? Well, there's a, okay, well, there's, um, if we, it's worth going over again about um, how some of those things come together uh, because they, we, we find ourselves coming full circle today, uh, looking at um, sort of the, the sort of the downstream um, types of uh, happenings, you know, in, in tech and media since those days. And so we, we, Kim and I think about this a lot lately, like it's interesting to actually have gone across this much time and to see how the sort of uh, the, the, the germination of uh, certain approaches, techniques, uh, and how those came, how those things came together. Um, you know, how the, how they made sense. There was, there was a logic to them at the time and the logic has proven itself insofar as, you know, today we can point at some really fairly elaborate and interesting new formats, you know, that to some degree are derivative. Um, we didn't invent precisely everything that, you know, seems it appears in some of those films, but what we were able to do were, we were able to bring together um, some different methodologies that existed in isolation and pull them together and combine them in a particular way. Um, there were, uh, you know, uh, sort of approaches, for example, a uh, very simple sort of approach to uh, measurement, measuring the shapes of, understanding the shapes of things uh, that you see in photographs uh, through a technique called photogrammetry. And it had been around for quite some time. It, photogrammetry was not invented by us. Uh, however, um, at the time it was, it seemed very esoteric and it was used, you know, to some degree by like architectural people or, or, um, engineers that were trying to understand the shapes of things as they, uh, were designing, uh, perhaps, you know, pieces that might fit together. So, uh, you know, if you were like, you know, uh, army corps of engineers type person back in the, uh, in the eighties or the seventies, you might go actually out and photograph, you know, some, uh, vehicle or some sort of site and you would under, you would learn, you know, the, the sort of dimensions of a thing from these photographs and you could use that to do your work. Um, anyhow, we started really looking at that method um, along with other methods, as Kim mentioned, this method, uh, this sort of uh, new at the time emergent sort of uh, uh, algorithmic approach called optical flow, which is analysis of every single frame in a sequence of frames to try to as well understand the shapes of things. So it was all about understanding the shapes of things. And the other uh, sort of major area, I mean, the other major area would be like understanding light in general, because uh, the one thing that, that joins all art forms really is how light, how do you approach light? How does light, is light represented? Um, so at any rate, back in those days, we, um, we're, you know, propositioned with a, uh, with really a creative, uh, a concept really. And the concept was embedded in the script of the matrix. And the concept actually could even be traced, you know, to even earlier, you know, types of works, for example, some of the works of Philip K. Dick or some of the, the crazy musings of Philip K. Dick, you know, that you could also sort of see oddly sort of the ghost of these of these ideas in the matrix script anyway so what we're presented is uh this this idea that you know only truly in a virtual reality would you be able to you know cheat time and space right as as as, uh, as physical beings here in the physical world i mean we can only move in a way that physics allows 
And same too with cameras, right? We can only move a camera so, fa so fast. You know, we can only um, sort of get from A to B. Uh, and uh, unless we had a time machine of some sort, right? To be able to jump or a portal. These are things that are now completely taken for granted in virtual reality, portaling around and, and, and cheating of time and space. So, so we're, we're presented with essentially these concepts and, and some uh, fantastic artwork, right? Uh, painted uh, or drawn by uh, some of the, like truly world-class comic book uh, uh, creators, right? That could imagine, you know, uh, limitlessly, right? They had fantastic imaginations. And so they would draw these, uh, you know, mind over matrix moments you know, where Neo was able to, you know, cheat time and space, avoid bullets, these things, right? So we're like, gosh, that looks difficult at the time. I mean, you have to really imagine standing in a time where it wasn't done before. So we, we decided, um, and this is the part that I think is sort of still relevant today. We were afforded the um, freedom to try to figure out a solution, any solution that we wanted, if we could get if we could arrive at um, the concept. And we uh, were not uh, you know, told you know, that we needed to try this technique or that technique. So the way we tried to work this out was to really think about how virtual reality might actually get made in the future, in the future of those days, which was mid nineties. And um, at the time we sort of reasoned that one would need to capture the world, right? And one would need to be able to capture human beings in a way, essentially record, volumetrically record us ourselves in the world, and then put this inside some form of, you know, computer simulation so that you could take a computer camera and freely move about uh, and move about. So essentially, the, the idea would be to use, you know, uh, some of the rudimentary ideas of, of both photogrammetry and optical flow to be able to construct essentially a, 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 a three-dimensional photograph, if you will, and a moving one at that, right? So if you could just imagine, you know, on your PC that, you know, like zoom out and here I am in a, you know, in some animation package and here I have what appears to be photography, but I can, I can now freely move around it, right, in my animation package with a, with a, with a camera. So it was uh, the process of being able to create those components, right? That, we, that was where we really came together. It's where, you know, Kim, other colleagues came together to try to understand. And there were other, there's a lot of people involved in this story. I mean, Paul, Paul DeBevick and his students, that, Paul DeBevick, who is currently at Google, uh, doing uh, uh, a super advanced light field uh, research, uh, light field photography research. You know, back in those days, he was, thinking about similar things. He had some very, very bright students that became great friends of ours. Um, and uh, we sort of, you know, adopted this, this, this clan of kids, you know, basically to come over and work with us to try to figure out this, you know, computational photography V.1 thing. Uh, and uh, yeah, so that's, those are some of the, some of the people and some of the elements and some of the, uh, the catalysts as John says, the, you know, the environments were achieved through photogrammetry and uh, a, an effort to try and digitize the real world. You know, then techniques over the last 20 years have expanded to, you know, dense stereo photogrammetry. And you see, you know, uh, companies like our friends at Quixel, part of Epic now, doing really, really detailed photogrammetry scans of objects. You know, in, in that day and age, you know, George Brashakov, who was responsible for that stuff, was you know doing basically point photogrammetry where you would effectively click on corresponding points of oh this is the corner of a building this is a corner of the helicopter or whatever whatever we were trying to reconstruct in 3D and then you'd eventually end up with this very crude 3D representation. The actors themselves, you know, the the, the original plan and if you were to go back into all the documentation which um, uh, which which we actually still have. Um, John had really been keen on the idea: could we not you know shoot something in a way that it absolutely turns into 3D in the computer that we can then view from any angle, which was, you know, the, the, which was uh, sort of what we were doing for the environments, but it just wasn't possible. In, in 1997, when we were designing the rig, um, uh, you know, we, we, we'd spent time with, you know, Frank, Frank Ago and his brother and um, Paul Clemente and Jesse trying to work out 
you know, could, could we could we do this with mo with movie cameras and a few of them, you know, maybe six or seven, um, and be able to do a virtual, you know, uh, warp around them? And it just wasn't it just wasn't possible. Cameras weren't at the resolution they needed to be. We were still using film. It just wasn't possible to do that. So we we settled on making a more pedestrian stills camera rig. But you know, even that in itself, 122 cameras that all have to be fired within a thousandth of a second of each other um, and make sure that, that they don't flicker in post-production and you're able to interpolate them through optical flow was a pretty, pretty mean feat. So anyway, we got it working. Um, uh, the, the rig actually was surprisingly reliable. Frank and the team did an amazing job of making something that, that served the purpose of that movie. But by the time we went on to the second movie, we're like, well, we don't want to do that again. And we had this this bigger challenge is that there wasn't just one Smith, there was hundreds and thousands of Agent Smiths. <laughs> so we're like trying to shoot multiple passes in the bullet time rig of Hugo and compositing that together. And it just wasn't, it just wasn't going to be possible. So we're like, okay, what was, what was it that John was saying in 97? Oh, how about we do uh, you know, four dimensional reconstruction of the characters. Now it wasn't, it wasn't feasible then, you know, when we started the research for that, it was 20 years ago. In fact, our, our first universal capture shoots were um, July 2000. Um, so a long, long time ago from now, um, uh, we just didn't feel it was possible to do the clothing and the bodies this way. Um, and as, as you can see, if you look at, you know, 40 captures a day, the state of the art, what Microsoft and others are doing, they're not up to the, you, you, you don't get the resolution you would need for a bullet time shot other than, other than things as, as it stands today. So what we decided to do was we'll do 4D capture or volumetric capture of the faces and then we'll bolt on computer generated bodies, which is sort of an homage anyway to what the story was about is that, you know, your, your residual self image is a simulated thing that is, you know, is, is puppeted by the impulses of your mind um, but is rendered effectively within a computer simulation, very similar to what we have today in, in modern video games. Um, but uh, um, it was it was pretty awesome. And, uh, you know, in recent years, we started to talk about, you know, actually, it was when they were work pre pre prepping Jupiter Ascending, the Wachowskis, they came back to us and asked us, hey, could we work out how to do a bullet time 2.0? type thing. And we basically <laughs> spec'd a whole volumetric capture system years before anybody actually saw one uh, evolve in the, in the wilds. So um, yeah, it's, 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 it's nice to have that continuum. You know, how do you digitize the real world in a way that you can explore it from all possible angles? Um, and at the same time, you know, we're, get, we're getting into such sophisticated computer graphics. You know, you could take the digital humans from Reloaded and Revolutions and I guarantee you they would look better and render in milliseconds of frames, a frame instead of you know, 10 hours of frame was what they were at the time. Uh, one, thing I would, <clears throat> one thing I would add to this, a couple things. One would be um, the, at the time and even all the way to now, often it's, you know, I, you know f folks making uh, stories in films, I mean, uh, stories in films are you know, are like beautiful sculptures. Uh, they're fixed in space, right? Once they're made and they're baked, they're done, right? They are immortally there to be re-experienced, but they don't change. And there is, there was always controversy back in those days about, you know, why would you need to make uh, a virtual actor in the first place? We have a real actor here, right? And a real actor can do things, <laughs> right? That are like just, uh, you know, real actors change immediately the nature of of the story in the film the moment they start expressing themselves. Suddenly it's evolving, right? The moment they enter the scene. There's no longer only about those words and no, not, not, you know, about the, the text stuff. However, so there was confusion at the time often like, why, why do this, right? And, you know, our justification at the time was twofold. One was uh, because at the time, you know, there were these feats, you know, these human feats that were impossible to do physically by an actor, like just the, the sheer, you know, magnitude of the stunts, perhaps at times, or even though we had super brilliant stunt teams, the same people that make the John Wick films today was our, our stunt team. Awesome. Um, I love those guys. Oh, uh, yeah. They're Supremo. And then we also had as well, uh, Wu Ping's 
uh, absolute like the world greatest, you know, martial artist as well. We, it was a spoil of riches really in that area. Um, and they've all gone on to do s prolific things. But anyway, so we're like, okay, well, we got that team. Like, do we really, yeah, are we really going to do stunts that are beyond that exceed their ability? Well, it really was more like exceeding the limits of wire and other technology. Anyhow, so we were like, okay, so we want virtual humans to do these, these things that are beyond human limits. And we also need to sort of uh, move our view, our perspective uh, in time and space in a way that was impossible in the physical world. And we needed the audience to know that. So we're like, okay, we've justified why we needed to do that for those films, the trilogy. But the rest of the industry was like, not sure, right? There was always this contentiousness about it. And the, um, the issue um, uh, sort of went away uh, with the advent of uh, the actual technologies uh, that the movie was about. So over time, um, you know, we found, uh, especially in the last five years, seven, eight years, right, that the emergence of XR, the emergence of virtual reality as a medium uh, that could be accessible commercially, uh, mixed reality. Um, suddenly uh, there was uh, very little argument on the, on the uh, value proposition of having the ability to record and or broadcast, immersively broadcast people. Right. So if I'm in a virtual reality environment and I want to essentially move uh, in any way I choose portal around human beings, other people who are there um, like I could in a game. Right. Um, then suddenly it made all the sense in the world to be able to have uh, sort of those captured people live or or pre captured people and the, the environments that we're in. Uh, uh, at my disposal. So suddenly, uh, <laughs> working on a film about virtual reality pointed us at, and we, 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 we did our best, right? We, we did our best to try to instinctually use techniques that we thought maybe virtual reality would require. And, uh, you know, down the road, we are uh, learning that these things, in fact, uh, are uh, incredibly useful. So Kim, Kim mentioned at the time, we called uh, our method universal capture, as in we capture everything, right? We're assembling everything. Um, over the years, that, uh, that term evolved to, uh, into vol volumetric capture. So if you're, in, if you're in XR, you know exactly what volumetric capture is about. And um, we're in the very, very early stages of this. But essentially, you know, just like at the beginning of this story, Kim and I were at this sort of uh, cross fade from analog to digital. Well, we're in a crossfade from um, essentially flat mediums into volumetric mediums, uh, everything. Uh, mixed reality, virtual reality, and gaming are gonna come together. They're gonna basically be built by the same things, right? There'll be a sort of, to some degree, a, a form of omni-media, um, and it'll be able to be experienced uh, through many, many different interfaces. But the, the basic idea though, is that the content itself is volumetric from the get-go uh, and meant to be experienced volumetrically, spatially uh, in a way that you can, you can move about it and perceive it as if it was really there with you. So- You know, um, what, what, one thing to add is that, you know, for digital humans, almost all the techniques that were pioneered on Matrix Reloaded, the way that we render you know, subsurface scattering for skin, the way that we do lighting and shadowing for hair, all these techniques are pretty much exactly the same thing, but running in real time um, in Unreal Engine today. So there, there is a, there's a direct lineage. Anybody wanting to produce high resolution, believable digital actors and performances are using 4D capture to be able to, to, to scan and digitize the, them characters and then solve against an animation rig. So it, 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 there is an absolute, like there's a, there's, you can see there's a, there's a direct line to what we did 20 years ago. And you know, we weren't the other, only people pioneering you know, rendering of di digital humans. There was a lot of work that Zemeckis did on his movies. You know, the, the big thing for us was try to preserve as much 
from the real world as you possibly can, whether it be measuring skin and reflectivity of skin or measuring the motion of skin um, and how the you know, bones and muscles move. Uh, uh, you know, these, these were the things that the core to our philosophy. Don't, like study the real world before you can actually emulate the real world. Um, but yeah, it's so, cool. It's really cool. And to I see would, so, and then what I would uh, also venture here to say is that, um, so the, you know, the, the sort of next building blocks that, you know, folks really should be looking at have nothing to do with entertainment at all, right? So we're like, we, we just happen to love stories and love world building and all of these things. But really the convergence that people need to sort of factor at the moment are taking place in other massive platforms, for example, you know, uh, maps. So if you, if you imagine like, you know, uh, those folks who, you know, whether it's working on virtual content for game or film or uh, a virtual reality, you know, experience right now, you know, tiny little, you know, steps in those directions. But imagine, you know, you've created essentially a virtual scene, your environment is flawlessly perfect, it's computational photography in its richest form, you have uh, 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 live broadcast, uh, you know, people that are being volumetrically captured. Uh, and so you've done this at like a one room unit, you know, a one set unit. Uh, but imagine that unit is just, you know, one 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 thing inside of a map right so imagine like in the in the olden times maps were on paper then they be, then the google uh, uh the you know keyhole folks and google earth folks you know started giving us maps that we could go into that were three-dimensional and over time we've started to uh see these maps become more and more sophisticated so you go inside your you go inside your google map and you know you can zoom out and you know, there you are, three-dimensional cityscape, right? And, you know, right now you go down on the street and they, yes, they have these 360 movies, which, you know, again, another building block. We did the entire Speed Racer movie with 360 movies. Um, so, but imagine these maps become essentially over time, they evolve, right, into, you know, really high resolution uh, and live, right, volumetric, uh, uh, you know, sort of uh, simulcast. And um, so that's, you know, look ahead into the next 10 years where you will start to see, right, where, you know, uh, maps essentially evolve into this. Um, the maps are basically a massive repository of live spatial data. So they're not dead, they're not static, they're not sculptures. They're actually like, here's where all the people are, here's where all the traffic is, here's Anything that somebody could, you know, through through Internet of Things, you know, essentially drive something right that's dynamic inside of these. So the so maps maps evolve into simulation. Maps are going to evolve into simulation, and then uh, they won't just be maps. The maps will as well be ingested by game engines, and then suddenly turned into the richest, most fantastical. Uh, sort of like playground, right, of not just real world things in the simulation, but fun fantasy things will also pour into these, these places as well. So, you know, imagine Fortnite in the future, you know, having flawless, beautiful depictions of places if they chose, if they wanted that. Um, imagine, you know, going into uh, a Fortnite-like environment, but it was an absolutely flawless depiction of London. Right, you're there. You're just in there, and all all sorts of fun, fantastic characters are being added into there. Um, so that's where this stuff is is going to go. And when and it's it's not really um, you know the domain of games and virtual reality. You know that content will itself be able to be broadcast back out, and the fantastic bits. You know will be able to be broadcast into the real world version of the same said place. So if I had a, if I had a, a brilliant, beautiful depiction of London in virtual reality or in gaming, online gaming, with all of the whatever we're doing in there for, for game and fun, 
uh, we, we could also be in the real world London, right? With, with mixed reality interfaces, whether that's glasses or contacts or phones, what have you. And on the streets, you know, could be uh, a simulcast as well of that content. And you will see something along the lines of a, a, a sort of real world, virtual world cross platform, uh, you know, uh, uh, sort of format. Uh, um, I know I spun out there, but I know we, we, we want to ch chat just moment a little, a few moments about the future, trying to yeah, draw a line was, between these things. Yeah, I was just going to say, you know, first of all, amazing, you had it here first. Second of all, what I'm getting is one, it takes a village to do these things. And two, you must have been told that you were crazy a whole bunch of times for thinking of some of, some of the ideas which you're thinking of. So my question is, what was the Actually, Emma, let me let me add to the crazy. You you wouldn't when we were making reloading revolutions, we were yeah. making it on this old navy base that um the Alamy, I don't know if you I don't know if you'll uh, remember a Star Trek four where they go to find a nuclear vessel so they can get some whatever, some radioactive particles, but I that's don't the remember. Place. That, that that's the place that we actually made the matrix movies on in alameda naval air station and we would have people come in for interviewing when we were trying to hire people to work on these crazy reloading revolutions movies and you'd see them leave after the interview and you'd see them burn rubber to get the hell out of there because they thought we were that insane so yes we we get we got used to it it's like you people are like crazy have you been beamed from the future it's like no no we can do this we can do it so it's always it's always you know there, there, there is a fine line between you know madness and just dreaming and you know de and delivering something that actually is going to be working and practical you know if, if somebody had asked us you know three years ago or, or told me hey kim you're gonna you, you and your company are gonna involve get involved in a concert that has 27 million people that attend this concert i would have gone you're crazy what what the, what the <laughs> hell is it but you know this is this is the the, the 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 world that we live in right now things are evolving so quickly you know that, that and you know john talks about you know digitizing the real world you know i think it's just as exciting to be able to to generate things and objects and worlds that you've never seen and collaborate you know we're not constrained by the laws of physics and actually you know as as people's um entertainment consumption taste evolves that you, you there was a lot of fear that as you start to do more and more trippy things people start to disconnect and not not enjoy them because it's not grounded in reality mm -hmm. but actually if you were if you did if you were part of our travis scott concert thing you'd know it was it would we did really trippy bizarre crazy things so it's, a, it's actually it's a very cool time in entertainment anyway sorry i'm on go, go ahead with <laughs> to you your questions uh, unfortunately now we're i think we're out of time but i just want to say thank you so much for your knowledge and your creativity i can't wait to see what you guys come up with next okay no worries we'll we'll send you an email I'll let you know <laughs> absolutely thanks guys cool all right thanks to oh, everybody wait i will ask I, i've been told i can't ask you what you're doing that so you guys can edit this bit in but what what are you guys doing there so you guys going to be working together on anything soon we we we, we might be he might be. He knows awesome. something. He knows something, people. <laughs> Stay tuned. <laughs> All right. Thanks, guys. Appreciate it. <laughs>